Well, hello again. Welcome to Horror in Detail. Today we are going to share Wendigo and Cryptids Encounter Stories. First story. Message from a Wendigo. I have been trapped here for too long. I can never forget the day I was taken. It was the dead of night. I had just killed my prey. A woman who had been foolish enough to wander into my home. I remember how happy I was that day. That I did not have to hunt. Instead the food brought itself to me. If only I had known then. That my delight would soon turn into terror. The men came into my home and overpowered me. There were three of them. They were large, much larger than the normal men I hunted. Perhaps in different circumstances, I would have killed and consumed them. But I was injured at the time. Not a grave injury, but it impeded me still. I had received the wound a week before from a particularly resilient man. He had beat at my foot with a rock, damaging my ankle. Even as I straddled his chest, tearing his throat open, looking back, I still find myself appreciating the man's sheer will, but I appreciated his flesh much more. Even without the injury, the men would have been difficult to conquer. As I said, they were large, but not only that. They were carrying strange metal poles. They were warriors of some kind. The poles fired darts that struck me and made me drowsy. The men threw me into a metal carriage that moved by means I knew not, and still do not know. It was within this carriage I lost consciousness. I awoke, I know not when, in a metal cage. I was still in a slight daze. There were men all around, all just as large as the three who had attacked me. Initially, I was ecstatic. I was surrounded by food, and I did not see any of the men who had taken me. These ones did not have any metal poles, so they were easy prey. But when I attempted to escape, I found myself unable to damage the cage in any way. I shrieked and roared and bashed at the cage. The men flinched in fear, and some pulled smaller metal objects from pouches at their hips. I drew myself to my full height still towering above the men, despite them being larger than the ones I was accustomed to. I felt something hit me in my back, and I turned my head to see another dart had struck me. One of the men who had taken me had been behind me the whole time, on the other side of the cage, and he had fired another dart at me. Once again, I fell unconscious. When I awoke again, I was in a room. It was larger than the cage I had previously been, ten paces wide and double across. But, this one did not offer the commodity of being able to see out of it. The walls were hard stone, and the door a harder metal. I tried to break out for hours, but I could not. I laid upon the ground, only thinking of my hunger. I was utterly ravenous. Whether it was morning, noon, or night, I had no way of knowing. All I knew was how famished I was. Even if only one day had passed since I had last eaten, it still would have been one day too many without food. My capture was, regrettably, my fault and mine alone. I had grown complacent. I was situated in a location with much prey, and I stayed for too long. I have lived for hundreds of years, and I have hunted in many places. I have preyed upon men of every color and creed. I have always hidden my tracks and never stayed in one place for too long. But I was lulled into a false sense of security. My home, a deep cavern, was one I thought no man would find me in. I should have fled when that woman entered my home. If she could find her way in, of course warriors could. I curse my foolishness, but I must look forward. The past cannot be undone. All of this happened a while ago. I can only estimate the length of time that has passed. I assume it to be a fortnight. One fortnight, stuck in this prison. One fortnight too many. The men frequently take me from the room. They always do it the same way. A small part of the door is opened, and meat is thrown in. I devour it, for I am starving, always. 
I am rendered comatose moments afterwards. They have poisoned the food. In the brief seconds before I am unconscious, I can see the door open and men enter. I always awake in the same room, but in a different position from where I fainted. I know the men are taking me somewhere and returning me. I know not where they are taking me, nor what they are doing to me. The only way to avoid this would be not to eat the meat, and that is no option at all. My hunger will not allow it. Sometimes, the men try to speak to me. I can speak their simple language, of course, but I say nothing to them. I have no interest in doing so. Most of the time, the men leave me be. Sometimes, if I roar and bellow and strike at the walls too much, five men will enter the room and hit me with darts. I have attempted to attack them, but their strength is shocking. I have grown weak since I arrived here. The men wrapped my injured foot in something. I am unsure of what it is, or what nefarious purpose it serves. I live in fear. I fear man. Man, whom I have preyed upon since I was created by the Great Spirit. Man, who have feared me, and indeed feared all Wendigos, now have made me feel fear. I fear their metal poles. I fear their size. I do not know why these ones are so big. A different tribe, perhaps. I am ashamed of myself for feeling this way. It is as if I am their pet. I often wonder where they get the meat from. It is man meat, without a doubt. They try to feed me other things, but I can only consume man meat. These men must kill and butcher their own kind to get it. Perhaps they consume other men as well. I shudder at the depravity of it. The thought of killing, or even worse, consuming my own kind, other Wendigos, makes me sick. I don't know what the people will do to me. I have heard a story of a Wendigo that was slaughtered by men. They chopped off his legs, then later cut him to small pieces. I imagine they will do something similar to me. Today, when I awoke, I found paper in my room. So, I write this message. I write it in my native tongue, which only Wendigos know, and is simply nonsensical gibberish to humans. I have no way of knowing where this message will go, but it is my only option. If any of my kind somehow finds this, please, save me. I will forever be in your debt. Dr. K. Bowman The preceding transcript was written by a man named Ned Terrell, Canadian, 2.05 m tall, 34 years old, worked as a dentist. Him and his girlfriend went missing three months and four days ago, and were presumed dead. Mr. Terrell lived a normal life prior to his disappearance. He received a proper education, was never abused, never had mental health issues, or any sort of violent behavior. All of his friends and family spoke of him quite highly, until they were informed of his actions. Those who knew Mr. Terrell noted that he had always been quite fascinated with superstitions, legends, and mythological creatures. On multiple occasions, he would go on trips to attempt to find these supernatural beings. He has traveled to Scotland to look for the Loch Ness Monster, America to find several creatures including Bigfoot and Mothman, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore to find a Pontianak, as well as several other countries. His most recent interest was the Wendigo. The Wendigo is a Native American legend, but is quite well known in Canada as well. It is somewhat surprising that Mr. Terrell never went looking for the Wendigo earlier than he did. The stories behind the Wendigo vary quite a fair amount. It is typically said to be a spirit that possesses humans and drives them to cannibalism, but it's also said to be its own individual creature which consumes human beings. Some sources also say that humans who resort to cannibalism to survive turn into Wendigos. Wendigos, despite often being depicted as anthropomorphic deer-like creatures, are actually traditionally described as giant humanoids that smell extremely foul and can cause a chill and in some iterations a blizzard wherever they go. Mr. Terrell went looking for the Wendigo on April the 6th. 
He went with his girlfriend, Iris Hall, 31. They went to Ontario and explored deep into a forest that will remain unnamed. They informed their family and friends that they would be gone for at least a week, maybe a few days more. An extreme blizzard hit the area they were in, and their families were worried. After they still had not returned after one week and five days, they were reported as missing. After nearly a month of searching, they were not found and were declared dead. Two weeks after this, it was noted that several children were reported missing from towns near the forest. Twenty children in four days. They found the bodies of several of the missing children, partially consumed. The worst was a six-year-old boy, who I won't name out of respect for him and his family. I saw the body and, while I won't go into detail, I will note that the damage was so severe it was presumed that a bear had attacked him. Wildlife control was called in to reduce the animal population of any predators in the area. Well over 50 men were deployed and, over the course of the next couple of months, tranquilized and relocated dozens of wolves and bears. But the attacks never stopped, or even slowed. While almost all the missing people were children, a very small number of adults also disappeared. Three to be precise. Two men, both aged 23, and one woman, aged 21. It is worth noting that all the adults who disappeared were extremely small in stature and could be mistaken for large children as opposed to adults. Finally, three wildlife control rangers happened across a cave with several bodies surrounding it. They entered. Upon entering, they found Mr. Terrell. He was standing over the remains of a young girl who has since been identified. She was 12 and was out for a hike when she passed by the cave and was taken. She lived about two hours away from the cave. Once again, I will not reveal her name. Due to Mr. Terrell recording everything he and his girlfriend did on the trip with an action camera, we know exactly what happened. The camera was found in the same cave as Mr. Terrell, and there are several videos recovered. The severely decomposed body of Iris Hall was also found. The videos are as follows. Videos 1 to 13. All are simply videos of Terrell and Hall exploring the wilderness. They come across as very likable, good-natured, and simply looking for fun. They kiss a lot, laugh a lot, and really love one another. In videos 8, 9, and 12, they speak about marriage and children. Video 14. After about a week of exploring, Terrell and Hall are ready to head back to civilization. Unfortunately, one of the worst blizzards in history occurred on that day. It would last for several weeks. Weather reports cite the temperature as dropping to 33 degrees Celsius. They took shelter in a cave. They are still extremely upbeat and perfectly composed. They had camping equipment and still had enough supplies for another few days. They make a few jokes, set up a small camp slightly far away from the mouth of the cave, then turn the camera off. Video 15. A video of Terrell and Hall exploring the cave. It is quite large. Terrell mentions the Wendigo and says it might be in there with them. He says that the cannibalism aspect of the Wendigo is what disturbs him the most, and that the very thought of it makes him somewhat nauseous. Hall questions how a human could sink to such depths. The video cuts off abruptly for no reason. Presumably a malfunction. Video 16. Another video of the duo exploring the cave. Iris suddenly slips and screams. Terrell rushes towards her. He carries her back to the camp. He pulls the camera off his head. It ends up face down in the dirt. The video lasts for several hours before turning off, presumably due to the camera running out of battery. Video 17. Terrell facing the camera. He is noticeably upset. He remarks that Hall's leg is severely injured, the blizzard's still going on, and their food is gone. He says he doesn't recall eating any, and Iris doesn't either. He stares blankly at something off-screen for several seconds, 
then turns the camera off. Video 18. A goodbye video from Terrell and a barely conscious Hall. Only the upper half of Hall can be seen, due to the lower half of her being covered by a blanket. It is impossible to know the extent of the injury she suffered from. Given how much blood is on the blanket, it can only be assumed it is very severe. The two genuinely think they're going to die. Video 19. Another video with Terrell facing the camera. He is scarily thin now. Skin like paper, sunken cheeks, blank expression. He says the blizzard has been going on for a long time and shows no signs of stopping. He remarks that he is starving to death. He talks about the Wendigo and mutters something under his breath. The word cannibalism is barely audible. Once again, he looks at something off camera. He turns the video off. Video 19 is the final video, but we can easily deduce what happens. Left with no choice, Mr. Terrell Cannibalus's Iris Hall. He has a psychotic breakdown. He cannot live with being a cannibal, and to save himself, convinces himself that he is not a cannibal. He is a wendigo, and eating humans is simply something he must do. The blizzard ends approximately six hours after this. Terrell begins his murder spree. I would now like to cross-reference the story Mr. Terrell wrote with facts that actually occurred. The note was written in French, Mr. Terrell's first language. Firstly, he calls the people he killed, men and women, despite them all being children. He also said that the men who took him were much larger than the ones he normally hunted. Of course, this is due to the former being adults. He may have done this to lessen his guilt. He hunted exclusively children due to how easy they are to capture. Upon finding Mr. Terrell, the rangers panicked and tranquilized Mr. Terrell. Despite being injected with enough tranquilizer to kill an average male, he survived. They threw him into a truck meant for animals and immediately drove to the nearest police station. He was placed in a holding cell. When he awoke, he attacked the bars of the cell. One wildlife control ranger was still present to give a statement to the police. He still had his trank rifle with him and shot Mr. Terrell yet again. Due to the panic he was in, he was not charged for anything, as it was a rather understandable reaction. After the holding cell, Mr. Terrell was later transferred directly to our mental facility and is currently locked in a room just down the hall. The process of getting him in here was a little scuffed, but we made it happen. We had to. He is without a doubt the most dangerous patient I've ever seen, but also the most fascinating. We feed him exclusively pork, as he spits out anything else we give him. I find it rather interesting that Mr. Terrell called the trank rifles, metal poles, and the truck a metal carriage. Without a doubt he knows what guns and trucks are. He seems to feign ignorance about many things. For instance, not knowing how much time has passed. There is a clock in his room. This shows how far his delusion goes. He has convinced himself that he knows nothing about human technology. Why would he? He's a wendigo. He also said that he had a foot injury from being hit with a rock. While he did have a hairline fracture, it was nothing major. We gave him a cast. He doesn't seem very fond of it. We do frequently remove Mr. Terrell from his room, but only so we can clean him. He won't do it himself, even though his room has a bathroom. Not to mention, we have to treat his infections and injuries. Living in a cave and eating people for a couple of months is not good for you. As for the sheet of paper he wrote on, I had it placed in his room today. Why? Sometimes... People write down exactly what's wrong with them. Terrell will stay locked up for the rest of his life and probably die still thinking he's a Wendigo. Nothing anyone has said or done can convince him otherwise. Myself, other doctors, and his friends and family. At least, the few friends and family still willing to see him. Terrell doesn't respond to anything we say. He's pretending not to understand us. 
We have come to the end of the story of Ned Terrell. Well, maybe not quite. He's already turned into an urban legend, and someday someone will probably make one of those serial killer documentaries about him, and after that a horror movie that'll say, based on true events. It'll probably be called The Canadian Cannibal, or something equally as tasteless. Another thing, Terrell is not entirely unique. Wendigo psychosis, a condition which causes humans to resort to cannibalism, has been observed before. To my knowledge, however, no case of it has ever been officially studied. I believe Terrell will be the first. Although we should probably rename the ailment to Terrell's disorder, or something along those lines. He is simply an insane man, that is all. Certainly not possessed by an evil spirit of any kind. I mean, come on. Wendigos? There's no such thing. Now if you'll excuse me, I must shut my windows. The temperature just took an absolute dive. It's rather chilly now. I think there's a blizzard coming in. Second story. There are things in the woods that will never be explained. It was almost 15 years ago now that I first met one of the most interesting people I know. True to that nature, I also met him in one of the most interesting and unexpected ways. I was out hiking on a trail in Washington State. It was a remote area, but one which I was fairly familiar with. On that particular day, I decided to venture far beyond the hiking trail I normally took to just for the sake of exploration. After some time, I entered a sunlit gully which led up to a local mountain, rife with blooming conifers and serene, glistening pines. I was alone that day, and felt my soul rejuvenate a bit with every breath of the fresh mountain air. After probably twenty minutes, I was well off the beaten trail and I found something worrying. I was about to take another step when I paused mid-stride, seeing a circular, jagged, metal ring laying just behind a small shrub. It was a good thing I didn't put my foot down, as the ring proved to be an improvised bear trap. The hell you doing out here? A gruff male voice suddenly shouted from somewhere unseen. I looked around, trying to find the person who had spoken, when he chose to step forward and reveal himself. An older man sporting a long gray beard then emerged from the brush. He had amber skin, long grayish black dreadlocks and a scar on his right cheek. He wore a raggedy brown coat that looked handwoven, and old jeans patched in multiple spots by mismatched fabric. His eyes burned like campfires, and his hands clutched a bolt-action rifle while his lip cradled a sizable wad of chew. I asked you a question, son. What are you doing here? After fumbling on my words for a moment, I was finally able to piece together a response. I was just out hiking, sorry. I didn't know anyone lived out here. The man seemed to silently inspect me for a moment. I felt my pulse soar in my chest as I wondered what he intended on doing. We were, after all, completely alone out there. You see that trap back there, son? He pointed to the same trap I had narrowly avoided stepping on a minute earlier. I nodded and swallowed hard. He tilted to the side and spewed a mouthful of tobacco spit into the dirt. Guess that means I gotta hide him better. He stared at me completely deadpan, and I felt my heart plunge into the depths of my stomach. I thought he was some maniac hillbilly cannibal hellbent on having me for lunch then, but then he suddenly burst into a fit of raspy laughter. I was left there confused and partially horrified as the man continued to cackle for several seconds. Oh, I'm just kidding son. He wiped a tear from his eye and recomposed himself as I continued silently debating whether or not I should run like hell. He slung the rifle over his shoulder and smiled at me. Apologies, buddy. My wife always said my sense of humor was a bit dark. I eyed the man over, and he suddenly seemed less sinister than he had a moment ago. There was a sense of jubilance in his gaze, like he was genuinely happy to see me. It's hard to explain, but it kept me from running. I forced a laugh myself. 
Good thing for both of us, I guess. This hiking has given me a major case of swamp ass. Can't imagine I taste too good. The man burst out into laughter once more, and this time I joined in. In that moment, I knew I had found a new friend. The man formally introduced himself not long after as Mark Hastings. After conversing for a while, he told me that he had lived in that particular area for a couple years at least, though admitted he didn't know exactly how long he'd been there. He said he left the city life behind in 96 foot and seemed quite surprised when I told him the current year was 2020. Mark's accent was something which struck me as quite interesting, as it was one I couldn't quite pin down. He had a slight southern drawl, and yet at times also sounded as though he may have had a bit of British influence as well. He pronounced words like again, as again, and had a strange vocal inflection. The best way I can really describe it as the way someone speaks in old black and white movies. Proper and yet somehow country. We got to talking, and he told me more about himself. He said he used to do construction back in the day, but when his wife got sick with cancer it really changed things for him. He said she battled it for almost three years, but eventually lost the fight. Afterwards he was left alone, and with a mountain of medical bills to account for. Rather than pay them off, and attempt to move forward, Mark chose a different path. It's funny you know? You work your ass off for years, begin building the life you want with the woman of your dreams, and then it all just falls apart for no good reason. Then when you at your lowest, good old Uncle Sam comes in and slaps you with a bill you ain't never gonna pay back. So I say, to hell with them. To hell with their taxes and debt. Out here I am truly free. There ain't nothing left for me in the real world anyways. There was a distinct glimmer of pain behind his gray eyes as he said it, and I felt myself feeling sorry for him. He wasn't at all what I expected when we first met. Just a normal guy whose life fell apart through no fault of his own. In a way I found it sort of admirable. The system beat him down, and rather than just accept it and be a good little wage slave, he left it all behind with one big middle finger. I visited Mark pretty regularly after that, and tried to make the trek out to see him at least once a month. He always seemed to have a smile on his face when I came to visit. Soon enough he even invited me back to his cabin for a fresh meal and some drinks. I was a bit hesitant at first, but decided to accept. Part of me expected him to prepare a meal of squirrels and tree bark when he first offered, but I couldn't have been more wrong. Mark made us a fresh rabbit stew with some homegrown potatoes and bread he had made from scratch. On top of that, he even had his own home-brewed ale to wash it all down. It was surprisingly delicious and really made me admire Mark more for his resourcefulness. He wasn't just some half-assed camper. He was truly a man of the land. His cabin was reminiscent of one that would have been used by early 18th century trappers. A handcrafted stone chimney was his only source of heat, while animal pelts covered the walls and strips of meat were drying on his jerky rack. There were two couches in the main room constructed of whittled wood and bearing handwoven pillows stuffed with feathers. He had no electronics of any kind claiming he didn't need those technologic doohickeys anyways. Mark had two bloodhounds, Rally and Daisy that lived there with him and were his only real companions. I eventually asked if he ever missed civilization or got lonely out there, but he immediately refuted the question. For a while, yeah, but not anymore. It's easy to forget about society when society already forgot about you. I really grew to admire Mark and even cherish our friendship. Over our many meetings, he would tell me stories about his life, told me all about his business and his wife before she passed. The way he spoke about her in particular truly broke my heart. He was a man who met his soulmate and built a life he loved with her, only to have it all ripped away by the cruel hands of fate. More than anything, though, Mark was always ready to tell me how much he hated the government. I think that was what made me like him the most. 
One night he and I were drinking some of his homebrewed honey ale and chilling around his campfire. He had just got done telling a story about a five-point buck that he had narrowly missed a few weeks earlier. He finished with admitting that he heard some weird, loud noise from the woods that scared it off before he could fire. That detail got me thinking, and since I've always been a fan of the paranormal and whatnot, I figured I'd go ahead and ask him, you ever seen anything really creepy out here? Mark's eyes opened wide, and he immediately lowered the mug from his lips. He wiped the suds from his bushy beard, and stared down at the campfire for a couple seconds. I could tell he knew exactly what I meant. He then chuckled and rocked in his chair with a smug grin. Zack, I tell ya, you don't know creepy until you've spent some time out here. He then began to tell me a story of when he had first began living out there. He said it took him close to a year to finally assemble his cabin, at least partially. During that time, he and his dogs were living in a simple tent. Mark said that a couple weeks after living there, he started noticing something odd. Every once in a while, he'd awake to find mutilated animals just outside the perimeter of his camp. Usually it was just small creatures like rabbits, birds, and squirrels, but it didn't stay that way. Over time, Mark began finding more and more corpses left at his camp. He thought it was the work of a puma at first, despite the fact that the corpses seemed to retain most of the meat. He quickly rethought that though when he found an actual puma corpse one morning, he said most of the animals had slash marks along their sides and necks, and many had been disemboweled. He began thinking it was the work of some deranged person, but even that thought didn't last long. One night as he was preparing to turn in for the evening, he heard a rustling sound coming from within the forest. He ducked down underneath some timber, in hopes of catching a glimpse of the culprit. Both of his dogs were already chained up for the night, so he knew it couldn't be one of them. A figure then emerged deeper in the woods. Mark said he didn't see the entire thing, but he could tell it was bipedal and scrawny. I asked if it could have been a bear with mange, but Mark claimed it was way too skinny for that. He said he'd seen sick bears before, and they looked and moved nothing like that thing. Mark initially planned on trying to shoot it, but after seeing that he admitted he didn't think that would have been a good idea. The creature dropped something on the perimeter, which Mark discovered the following morning was the corpse of a raccoon. The thing's head then tilted and appeared to stare directly towards Mark. They just stared there in silence for several seconds until the dogs began snarling voraciously from inside the tent. They must have caught its scent and the thing suddenly crouched on all fours and dashed off back into the woods as the dogs went ballistic. Mark didn't know what he had seen that night and apparently never saw it again. To me, it sounded like a Wendigo or Skinwalker based on his description. I told him that, but he had no idea what those things were. He seemed to think the thing was actually leaving him gifts, but I wasn't so sure about that. I asked him about the typical creatures as seen in creepy pasta and television lore. I mentioned the Wendigo, Skinwalkers, Slender Man, the Rake, Siren Head, and some of the well-known others, but Mark didn't seem to know anything about any of them. He did however know about something he called the Whistler. Apparently, ever since he had been out there, he heard an odd whistling sound on occasion. It started off as little more than a dull, barely audible noise in the distance. He said at times it would come closer, and at others it seemed like it was further away. Mark thought it was a bird for the longest time, but one night he found the truth. He was chopping wood, when suddenly the whistling noise emerged. This time it was different, and this time it was closer than ever before. Suddenly there was a rustling noise from behind him. Mark spun back, but only saw a few branches bristling back and forth. He then heard the whistle again louder than ever before. He looked up and there it was. About 20 feet up in a large oak tree was some kind of figure. 
Mark described it as kind of human with a head that looked like some fucked up eel. He said he saw the thing stare down at him with beady black eyes. He just froze, and before he could do anything the thing suddenly leapt from the tree. It crashed into another one further away, and continued whistling and crashing as it blended into the depths of the woods. I didn't know what to say to that. I have heard legends about the whistlers out in the woods, but never heard about anyone having actually seen them. The way he described it sounded quite creative, and I wondered whether he was capable of an imagination so elaborate, or if he had actually seen what he claimed. I asked him whether he thought this whistler was the same creature that was leaving him corpses, but he just shook his head. Without being prompted, he told me another tale about hearing voices in the woods sometimes. Sometimes it was that of an old man, sometimes that of a young girl, and sometimes it didn't sound human at all. I wondered whether my new friend was perhaps schizophrenic or suffering from some mental illness that caused him to hear these things. I obviously didn't tell him that, but his claims had to be met with some amount of skepticism. What do you think it was? Mark leaned back and his head swiveled on his shoulders. No clue, son, and part of me hopes I never find out. He went on to explain that he'd continued hearing voices on occasion, but never saw who or what was making them. He seemed to think all the voices were coming from the same entity, though. Without being prompted, he took the conversation an entirely new accusatory direction. It's the goddamn government, Zack. Messin' with things they got no business messin' with? He then delved into a conspiratorial rant about how the government and specifically the guys in black trucks that were up to some really shady antics. He said they knew about the gates in the forest and had been actively trying to open them. He didn't elaborate on what exactly he meant by that. You see them out here? You know, government, CIA? Mark looked confused. Taya? He asked. It was my turn to look confused then. Yeah, Central Intelligence Agency? You know Men in Black, MK Ultra, and whatnot. Mark still appeared slightly puzzled. I didn't understand how a guy like him who hated the government to such an extreme degree had apparently never heard of the mother of all conspiracy agencies like the CIA. He then seemed to have an epiphany and his eyes lit up in recognition. Oh yeah, I forgot all about them. He then laughed and shook his head as he downed another swig of ale. My memory ain't what it used to be, I'm afraid. Goddamn, how could I forget them? Well, in my defense, they don't carry no badges out here. And their vehicles don't exactly advertise who they work for. He paused and rubbed the back of his neck. But you've seen them out here? Mark met my eyes and nodded. Oh yeah. Mark told me that one time he had been tracking elk through the woods in late autumn. He'd followed the trail for a few miles, when he suddenly heard a noise coming from a grove up ahead. It sounded nothing like a bear though, and more like several people arguing. Mark crept slowly forward, taking care to not disturb the foliage and remain out of sight. After a couple seconds, he saw the outline of several people emerge in the grove. One man was on his knees in the center, while four men in black suits surrounded him. The man on his knees had open wounds and bruises upon his face, and his clothing was torn and tattered. He was begging the others for mercy, but they didn't appear to be the forgiving type. Two of the men were speaking quietly to one another while the other two stood watch over their apparent captive. The man on his knees was dressed in white, with Mark describing his clothes as looking like a surgeon's uniform, or maybe the attire of someone from an insane asylum. He listened but couldn't make out what the two other men were talking about, but they were clearly arguing. The man on his knees appeared to be weeping softly. Mark said he didn't know what to do, and before he could do anything one of the two men who had previously been arguing stepped away. Without a word the man stepped behind the captive, lifted a pistol to the back of the man in White's head and pulled the trigger. Mark described seeing a splash of red, 
but said the weapon made a lot less noise than he thought it would. The man in white went limp and fell face first into the dirt. Holy shit, I said, mouth falling agape as Mark concluded his story. I eyed him closely, but didn't see any aura of boasting in his eyes. They didn't twinkle like that of a man who tried telling a fabricated story to simply amaze or impress an audience. He didn't meet my gaze at all as a matter of fact. He just clasped his hands in front of his mouth and stared into the campfire with a somber gaze. It was clear to me that what he was either an accomplished actor or what he had witnessed truly haunted him. Poor boy couldn't be been much older than you. I wish I would have done something but I just ran. He shook his head, and his eyes seemed to glaze over. I just stay quiet, as there was nothing I could think to say. After a couple moments of lingering silence, Mark finally spoke again. Zack, I gotta tell you a secret. He looked in the eye, and I gulped down the lump in my throat. I don't particularly care for the government. I chuckled and Mark let out a small laugh. I think you've mentioned that once or twice. I replied with a laugh. Yeah, suppose I have, but it's not just because the IRS is after my ass. It's because of things like what I saw that day. It's because government corrupts by its very nature. It takes what it wants and destroys those who oppose it. Ain't no justice, no considerations and nothing you can do about it. Now I don't know the details of what they were disagreeing on that night, but I guarantee you, that boy didn't deserve what he got. I nodded, but wasn't entirely convinced that he witnessed what he thought he had. You sure it was government that did that? Could have been drug dealers or mafia. Mark hunched his shoulders and gave a snide chuckle. What's the difference? I chuckled, but didn't have a response. Well I see why you'd think that but that's because you ain't spent as much time out here as I have. But what you don't know, and what no one is supposed to know, is about the tunnels. I peeked an eyebrow at that comment. Tunnels? Mark grinned and nodded back. There are a series of tunnels that run deep below the earth. Gotta be a couple dozen of them within a few miles of us now. Government knows about him. Maybe they built him, but, well, I doubt that. I think they're just interested by what's inside. And that is? I asked, now on the edge of my seat. Mark scoffed and shook his head. I have no idea, but it's gotta be something bad. I was a bit disappointed with that answer, but Mark immediately drew my curiosity back. You wanna see one of him? I nodded without even really thinking. Mark grinned. I figured you might. It's a bit late in the day to go now, so what I is say we head out there first thing in the morning. I agreed without hesitance, and promised to return the next morning to meet up with Mark. I walked back down the trail that day with my imagination running wild. As I mentioned, I liked Mark and very much enjoyed our conversations. To me, he was somewhat like a compassionate grandfather with a plethora of exuberant stories that may or may not have been slightly exaggerated. I thought about all he had told me, about the animal carcasses, the whistling thing, the voices and the tunnels. I wanted to believe him, but urban legends abound in our day and age. I was well aware that perhaps he had just concocted these stories after his decades of isolation. I needed to see some proof for myself. Dew glistened on the leaves illuminated by the crimson sun rising over the hills as I set off the next morning. It was a bit chilly as I walked, but thoughts of the unknown kept me warm as I walked. Before long I arrived at Mark and I's usual meeting spot and found him already waiting there for me. He greeted me and without hesitation we began the trek out to his spot. We made small talk on the way, mostly about asinine topics like my family and work. After maybe 15 minutes of walking, we rounded a small bend tucked behind a small grove of trees. Mark stepped out in front and turned to face me. He then grinned and outstretched his hand to the right. I followed his gesture and felt my jaw strike the floor. 
There was an opening in the side of the hill that was lined with smooth stone and bricks. It was quite enormous, with the perimeter having to have been at least 15 feet wide. The opening appeared collapsed and the entrance was filled with rubble and dirt, looking as though someone had intentionally yet clumsily sealed it. This is the tunnel? I asked. Mark nodded. One of many, but it wasn't sealed up like this last time I was here. How long ago was that? Mark shrugged. Dunno, maybe a year or two. I looked back at the collapsed tunnel. It was clear someone had gone through a great deal of effort to construct it, but the construction didn't look like a mining operation. I'm no expert in mining or anything, but I can't imagine they would spend time laying brick and creating such a wide entrance. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but the more curious fact was why it had been sealed up. I thought maybe it was just vandals, but that explanation somehow didn't satisfy. What's inside? I asked. Mark paused for a moment and stared towards the wreckage. He then shook his head and spat into the dirt. Bad things. I hoped he'd elaborate on that, but he didn't. I mean it'd have to be for someone to seal it up like this, right? That's an impressive hole. Would've taken a great deal of effort. He was right about that, but I still felt there was information he was withholding from me. You think this is the government's work? Mark nodded. Not a single doubt in my mind about it. Mark's head then suddenly flicked to the side, and he stared out into the trees as if something had alerted him. I watched the color drain from his cheeks as his mouth pursed open. We should go. I don't like lingering here for too long. I didn't argue, as clearly something had spooked him. He and I trekked back to his cabin, checking his snares on the way back. Mark found a pair of rabbits in his traps, and after swiftly snapping their necks he slung them over his shoulder. We got back to his cabin, and Mark set to work on harvesting the meat from the rabbits for his stew. I sat around, petting Daisy and Rally as they slobbered all over my knee and panted endlessly. I don't think I ever told you about the scariest part of living out here, did I? Mark asked. I looked up from the two dogs and stared at him, heart now beating with excitement. Mark sauntered over, carrying the meat of the rabbits along with a clump of chopped vegetables. He dumped the plate into the simmering cauldron on the fire, then took a seat across the fire. I stayed silent as he stared down at the flickering flames in deep thought. There are things out there that people don't know about. Creatures, places and things that would seem to defy all explanation. The advancement of society and technology has led people to believe they're safe, and for the most part, they're right. So long as they stay out of the woods, those things can't get them, but there is something that can. Mark paused and looked me dead in the eye. I call it the silence. He paused as if to allow the words to accumulate the dread he felt they deserved. I had an inkling of an idea where the conversation was headed, but just waited for him to explain. There's been rumors about it for a very long time, and it's something that has been affecting humanity for centuries, if not millennia. People have only just begun to realize it. But if they knew the true extent of what's going on well, no one would ever go into the woods again. He paused and leaned in to stir the pot a bit, before sitting back. People disappear, Zack. No reason for it, no explanation, and no bodies are ever found. The cases seem to defy all explanation, and it happens again and again. Mark then suddenly grunted and began rubbing his eye. A damn smoke. Sorry. Where was I? The disappearances. I replied. Mark seemed suddenly hesitant, as if he didn't know whether he should continue. Yeah the disappearances. I don't particularly like talking about this if I'm being honest, it's not really my business, but you're a good kid Zach, and I know you come out here a lot, and I'd be devastated if anything were to happen to you. Dread crept around me like dozens of little spiders scurrying on my flesh. I couldn't help but raise my guard, 
and wonder where exactly this conversation was headed. Mark went on to tell me about this silence he mentioned. He said if ever I was walking through the woods and everything went completely silent, I was to drop to my knees and put my face in the dirt immediately. He said to stay that way until sounds return to normal. And what if the sound doesn't come back? I asked, spine tingling with anxiety. Mark looked me dead in the eye, and his words offered nothing of comfort. Then God help you. He said no more about the subject, and I didn't push him on it. It was clear he really wasn't comfortable discussing it beyond his initial warning. If he had any theories about what was responsible, he didn't voice them. The whole conversation had given me strong missing, for Eleven vibes, and I wondered whether he was referring to the same phenomenon. Both of us just sort of lingered in silence for a while as the stew finished cooking. A few minutes later Mark leaned in and scooped two servings into bowls, handing one of them to me. The stew was delicious as usual, and I happily scarfed it down as Mark provided his hounds with their dinner as well, although didn't so much as nibble on his own serving. What do you know about mimics? I don't know why exactly I asked, but the thought had suddenly arisen in my mind. Mark seemed to perk up, but yet stared back with a look of confusion that seemed to contradict his reaction. I'm sorry, what? Mimics. I clarified. Some people call them imposters or liars. Things that look and try to act human but aren't. Mark stared back at me, and a small grin slithered onto his face. Now what would make you ask a question like that? Mark's grin evaporated, and he stared back with something akin to contempt. Truth is, some of the things I'd seen from him made me question who he claimed he was. There was just a subtle wrongness to him in a way I've never felt the words to accurately describe. Just curious, I replied. Staring back, Mark chuckled, but without any humor in his tone. Your kind always is. Ever since your brothers took up arms against one another in the war of gray and blue, your curiosity has been quite insatiable. You think this land belongs to you. Like this country is your own personal proving grounds to pillage and destroy as you please. His form seemed to shift as he spoke his eyes shrinking in their sockets and his skin seemed to twitch, his teeth bared like the fangs of a cougar, and his long black hair flowing like a clump of wild eels. He leaned forward, in a gaze that no longer seemed entirely human. Zack, there are things out here that your world of science and logic will never understand, and these things are better left alone. He and I just stared at one another, and I felt my heart beginning to thump away in my chest. I thought about his words, the war of gray and blue. Could he have been referring to the American Civil War? Why reference that event specifically? What year did you say you moved out here? I asked. Mark grinned again, now appearing more menacing than ever before. 96. 18. 96. I shook my head. I don't understand. I replied, shaking my head. Your kind never does. His voice had suddenly changed, becoming much more high-pitched like that of a young girl. His head cocked to the side, and his grin grew almost literally ear to ear as his mouth stretched impossibly wide. Your kind has conquered this world. Both beast and nature bow at your might. You live in comfort, convinced that there is nothing that can hurt you anymore. His voice had changed again, sounding like a raspy, Scottish man with rolled R's. But you are wrong. His voice had changed again, like that of a young, rebellious boy resisting his parents' wishes in a juvenile defiance. Mark then stood, and his form extended, making him tower over me and the campsite. Even Daisy and Rally started altering their form, like they were also simply hiding their true form. I rose and backed away, no longer seeing Mark as the friendly hermit I had though him to be. I thought that moment would be my end, 
and that the beast which hid itself in the form of Mark was prepared to devour me whole. Before he did, I had one final question I had to ask. What are you? Mark chuckled, his form continuing to grow abhorrently inhuman. He then shook his monstrous head. Wrong question. His words bellowed forth, spoken in the chorus of a thousand voices all in unison. I took another step back, wondering what he, it could have meant by that. It then struck me. What do you want? The thing I had once known as Mark stared down at me with an entirely inhuman gaze. To watch and protect, we stared at one another, and I attempted to understand what was happening. After all he had told me, and his time devoted to actually speaking with me, part of me almost wanted to believe his words were meant to reassure me, like he was conveying that it was me, or more generally humanity as a whole he wished to protect. After ruminating on it for a while, though, I don't think that's the case anymore. Why are you telling me all this? The thing I had once known as Mark grinned, as if that was the question he was waiting to hear. So that you can tell the world. And so, I have. I left Mark and that trail behind, and I have not been back since. That's why I'm here now. To tell the world, as the thing I once knew as Mark instructed me to. I don't even know why, or what exactly I'm supposed to be telling. Maybe that Mark is not human, and that there are things in the woods that will never be fully understood. Or maybe that he is watching, and something has given him a great deal of power for some reason. I wish I had more answers, but I had to share this, regardless of whether anyone will believe it. And needless to say, I don't think I'll be visiting Mark again anytime soon. Third story. The night I met the Wendigo. At ten feet tall, it towered above me. Emaciated arms grazed against the frozen ground with claws made of ice. Blood dripped from ragged, withered antlers. It looked at me with bloodshot eyes and gave me an all-too-human smile despite its long, needle-like teeth. As it leaned closer, I smelled the wicked stench of death on its breath. It drew back its head and let out a gut-wrenching howl that turned my blood to ice. Even so, I remained unfazed. Hypothermia had dulled my senses as the temperatures dropped. I had come here to die, and one way or another, it was going to happen. I was in too deep, and there wasn't much else to lose anymore. The thing happened to sense my acceptance of the inevitable, and sat next to me. Surprised, I met its glance. Aren't you going to kill me? It looked down upon me and something in its expression changed. For a split second, it looked wise. Almost human. The sky grayed as it began to speak. No. Its voice was low and rasping. Your suffering now feeds me more than if you were dead. I stared off into the darkness. The thing next to me took out a glass jar. It was roughly the size of my head, but was dwarfed in the being's hands. As it opened it, its claws scraped against the glass like nails on a chalkboard. It looked down at me. Your anger warms you now, but all fires burn out. You won't have much longer. It wasn't wrong. There was no way I should be alive right now. With a swift motion it struck my face with its claw and sliced open my cheek. But no blood came. Instead, a milky, iridescent fluid leaked out of the wound. It billowed and swirled around my head. Memories. Beautiful, wonderful memories. I saw my sister, tall and lanky with wavy blonde hair, spinning in her favorite skirt. I could almost hear her laugh, dancing to the radio at midnight when she thought no one could hear. Squealing with delight as we sped down the highway with the windows down. I smiled but soon the memories turned sour. I then saw her body, limp and broken after I took that turn too fast. The car was crumpled into a tree, and I could only watch, helpless as my life burned to the ground in front of me. 
I felt the heat rise up in my chest, but the creature collected the haze around me in a jar and shut it. I snapped back to a cold, gray reality. I felt numb. I couldn't feel anything. I didn't know anything. Who I was, where I was, or what was sitting in front of me with a terrible smile on its face. But at that point, I couldn't even care. She forgives you, it said as it lumbered off into the night. I didn't know who he was talking about, but the snow around me had formed a warm blanket, the stars began to fade away, and I knew then that it was time for me to go. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end. Subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comments section, and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.